What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to another dope edition of Define Your Legacy, all right? And before we tap into today's episode, just want to shout out the online store for Define Your Legacy, all right? Which can be found at the link in the description of this episode, all right? We have t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and even masks, all right? So feel free to support the podcast and check out the online store, which can be found in the link of this episode's description, all right? And we got my man Brandon on the show today, man. What's going on? Hey, I'm good, man. Thanks for letting me tap in with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so it was dope too. I got to be able to introduce myself to you, and we talked a little bit beforehand before this recording. Um, so hopefully, obviously, you know, we can tap into uh, mobile home investing, right? Um, that's another sure. stream of income that a lot of um, people have tapped into, but at the same time, right, a lot of people need to be informed on. Um, mm-hmm. So if you could just introduce yourself um, and tell the world what it is that you do. Hey, yeah, um, my name is Brandon, Brandon Boyd, full name, government name. Um, yeah, and really, I just help people, you know, get into real estate investing through mobile home investing, basically the non-traditional route. People that look like me and you were often told, you know, buy a house, you know, house hack, buy an apartment building, things like that. And usually equity is the, or money is the the biggest issue, biggest hurdle we have. So, you know, I discovered mobile home investing and been doing it for like three years. I actually quit my, my corporate nine to five. Um, about a year and a half ago, I've been doing it full time ever since. And uh, it's it's crazy. Once you dive in, you see the opportunities that are there that, frankly, we were never introduced to. Hmm. OK, OK. So I, I, I got a couple of things out of that. I got some from the beginning, the middle and the end. Um, yeah. So the beginning, right, mm-hmm. when, when we talk about um, just the idea of overall mobile home um, investing, the first thing you said was to help people. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I asked you you know, who you were and tell us the world what it is that you do. And your first response initially was to help people, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean to you to know that you're now in an industry where you're able to actually help people? Well, I guess it it really starts back from childhood, right? So growing up, I was, I mean, if anything, you could say I was the the statistic, you know, single mother, multiple kids, you know, growing up, uh, I grew up in Atlanta. So we lived in, you know, mediocre at best housing, you know, and all that. And the one thing I kept noticing is that there was literally nowhere that was affordable to live, like no matter where, even in the quote unquote hoods. Right. A lot of that was still subsidized housing. You still they still couldn't afford to even live in some of the worst apartment complexes in the city. Right. And then as I got older, um, I was looking to invest, obviously. But what drew me to mobile home investing was that I saw an opportunity where, OK, I can help families just like I was when I was younger, be able to get in a house that is actually an asset that they can then leverage later on to buy that house if they feel like it. Or if they, for whatever reason, don't want to, they can't afford it. The point is they actually own something now, like they have actual ownership and people don't really understand how much pride people take in when they can say, this is mine. And that was the biggest thing where I realized like I can actually help a family on one side to actually own something, to have something to call home that is clean, that's safe, that they can actually afford. But then on the other side, myself, I can provide for my family. I can actually leave something beyond just, you know, whatever corporate is willing to pay me. Right. And then also is it was a a whole nother asset class that people like, again, like me, like me and you, how we looked that we knew nothing about. And then once I dug into it even more, I started to see there are definitely investors in this space, but they are purposely almost keeping it like like a secret or low key right because it's so low as far as the entry point and but the but the returns are ridiculous um so you know that that's i guess just to answer your question um really why i just felt like this is the space i need to be in to be able to help people but also be able to help myself and not have to feel bad like i'm you know gouging people or anything like that in the process but why do you think that's the case though right like people that might be in the industry might be a little bit more low and kind of low key about it in terms of posting on social? Cause you know, the common ones that people, um, businesses that open up now, you know, like a mobile homes in my opinion may not be at the top of that list. So why do you think that is? I think it's like most things, right? Like if you think about it, a lot of the investing we do now, we were not introduced to at, at its, at its, uh, at its, you know, introduction, right? Like for instance, crypto, right? That's what, that's a really, really big thing now. I actually remember, so I, I I was big into technology. That's basically my background. I was a, a did a lot with database management and analytics and things like that. So as a youngster, so to speak, you know, I was on the dark web, right, doing my thing, you know, movies and all that. But back then, we were actually I didn't even realize it at the time, but we were actually buying crypto back then to be able to exchange 
you know, on the internet funds and things like that, right? So if you've seen the movie Dope, that was a movie that came out a while back and that's literally what they did, right? So it's like, this thing was in front of our face, but yeah, we knew nothing about it. We never heard of it. It was just brand new. And now it's like a thing, right? And there's many other industries that are the same way. And I feel like what happens is certain people that have a certain amount of wealth, um, they frankly just get to the point where they just want to kind of hone it for their own families. They feel like there's not enough to go around. Um, and that's definitely where I feel like that scarcity mindset sets in. And, and I'm, I'm hoping our community, we don't fall into that same trap to where we start withholding from one another. So when it's like, look, there's plenty for, uh, for all of us to eat. And the best thing is like our, our community, we're innovators. Like we, we set trends, we lead the way. So it's like, look, we, we get in spaces and then we start to branch off and create other spaces. And that's what I want, right? Like mobile home investing, I think is a great catalyst for a lot of people to get into and then start to create even other things. Like I know people that are creating smart cities now, but they started in mobile home investing. I know people that are looking to create their own mortgage companies. They started in mobile home investing, right? So I'm saying like, this is definitely a space to where I think um, it was it was trying to be kept low key for the purposes of trying to kind of keep the wealth. Um, but of course, once we come in, we kick the door down and you know, we're gonna go from there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I'm big on that too, a point you made, just the idea like we all can eat, like mm-hmm. we all can win. And that's why I think your story and just the idea of helping people is extremely important. Um, but that, right, is that touched on the beginning part of your story. Yep. And in the middle of your story, another thing that I, I, I heard you mention was the idea that you were able to leave your nine to five with mm-hmm. it. So talk to me about that as well. Yeah, man. So I worked at a finance firm, really well-known finance firm. Um, and my whole idea was like, you know what? I, I really like this technology thing. You know, I'm, I'm going to work every day. I'm uh, programming. I'm moving data around. I'm building out analytics models and things like that for performance reporting. Really enjoyed it. Um, I was, you know, one of the one of the better people at it. Right. Don't want to flex my muscles too much, but I was one of the be- one of the better ones at it. Moved up very, very fast. Um, you know, and frankly, like my first job out of college, I made more than my mom ever made, ever made. You know what I'm saying? My first job out of college. So I was like, you know what? This is this is dope. Like this is this is before I had even thought about entrepreneurship, had ever thought about real estate, had ever thought about like anything beyond just work. So my whole mission was, as I would say, I'm trying to become an alphabet boy. I'm trying to be the CEO. I'm trying to be, you know, CIO or CTO or something like that, you know, top of the company, everything like that. So, you know, life goes on, right? You you know, you're you're turning the wheel, spinning the wheel, going to work every day. Life continues. I get married. You know, I have a few kids. And then I start to look around and I realize, like, this job isn't fulfilling me. Like, I'm really, I wasn't happy, quite honestly, right? I would even say, especially towards the end, my wife would probably even say, you know, I went into like a a low-key, like, depression almost, where it became just, I'm getting up just to go to work, just to pay a bill at home, right? I, I, I had no purpose to what I was doing. Um, and that's really a point too, when I looked at my, my kids, I have three sons. I was looking at them and I'm like, well, what kind of example am I setting for them? Like, what am I showing them as somebody who's literally going to collect a paycheck and there should be something more to what you're doing. The paycheck or the payoff should kind of be your reward for whatever the blessing is that you provided. Um, and I was just like, you know what, this ain't it, right? So I looked into real estate. Um, and as I said, you know, just a bunch of things in there just wasn't really I just wasn't really jiving with it that much. And then I got into the mobile home space and I realized like I could help families because a lot of these families that I run into, they might not look like my family, but they have the remnants of it, right? Like some of them are lower income. Some of them have plenty of money, but they don't have like uh, the credit backing or things like that. Some people are just like, look, we just really need a, a safe place to stay. Like I've dealt with, you know, women coming from domestic situations I've dealt with fathers that, you know, recently divorced, you know, and they hold custody battle. I've dealt with families that literally are just like, hey, we just like to live minimalist. We have the money. We just want to live minimalist. So it, you're you're solving a problem for them, um, which is really why I was like, I wish somebody was around back then to help us solve that problem. Right. Like if they would have told my mom, hey, you can go over here, half the price, buy this home. You'll even have some land with it. Right. You can have all of that for this little price. The only thing is wrap your mind around not living in a traditional house, but wrap your mind around you being free and clear and having home ownership and being able to pass that to your kids who can pass it to their kids. And, and, you know, next thing you know, it's just become, it becomes a generational thing. Um, so I'm hoping to be that person or at least participate um, in the, in the, you know, uh, uh, battle to hopefully uplift some of these families and introduce them to a different way of thinking 
um, that maybe they weren't introduced to before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think shifting the mindset is important mm-hmm. too, right? You talk about education and just the idea of if someone knew better, they would do yeah, better. But the problem sure. is that can't happen if they don't simply know or have been introduced to said topics. Um, yep. But one thing I, I want to ask you on too um, mm-hmm. is, or actually a couple of things. Number one, yep. you mentioned your first job out of college, you mm-hmm. made more money yep. than your mom ever did. And yep. I don't want to just ask you, how did that make you feel? But I am curious to the overall mentality behind realizing that you can make money, real money, right? At a young age, right? That mm-hmm. you didn't have to wait until you were further along in your life, that you got to it early. Yeah. Well, I'll say, I mean, looking at it on his face, I was like, man, my mom ain't really make that much money. You know, when you're a kid and you don't really understand like how bills and finances and all those things work, like you think you do, you think you like, oh man, you got to pay that whoop de whoop. You realize like, oh man, she really made that stretch. Like she had two kids, you know, job, all this other stuff she had going. I was playing sports and everything. And she really made that stretch to, to make us not feel like we were inferior, like not feel like we were worthless, right? She, she did that. Um, so for me, when I, when I got that first job, I mean, it felt great on his face. Like, oh man, this is dope. Like I got a job. I know a lot of my peers, they definitely weren't making the type of money I was making. Granted, they were in different fields, but they weren't making that type of money. So of course they were, you know, they were the college worthless crowd or whatnot. Um, but then also made me feel kind of like, dang, like, dang, my mom was, you know, grown woman, kids in high school and wasn't even making this much. Now, granted things have changed and everything like that. But the point was like, she had to go through that. Um, and I always think about, I believe it was Jay-Z talking about, you know, I, I went through that. So you ain't had to go through that. And that's how I look at it with my mom. Like she went through all that. She kind of showed me the work ethic to, she never complained. She's, you know, short little woman, right? But she don't complain. She just do her, she just did her job and and made sure that we were we were cared for. Yeah. So that's what I took it in, you know, myself when I, I got to work um, my job and my kids and everything like that. I'm like, yo, just get the work done. Don't complain about it because things could be 10 times worse, but you've been blessed. You know, you got a, a job that's paying you and all that kind of stuff. So um for me, it was it was definitely like eye-opening, um, but definitely like sparked something as well um to not just kind of sit on your laurels. Yeah. And, and I think as black men, like you grow up in a single parent household and like, mm-hmm. you know, you see your mom, not necessarily struggle, but, you know, she, she does what has to be done. But you don't exactly. realize that at a young age, it's like the, the pressure or the things mm-hmm. that happen that you don't see. And now as an adult, you realize like, man, like I got to really get my bag to make sure that she is straight or that the next generation is also straight. Exactly. Um, and then talking about the future as well as the past. Another thing that I noticed from your story was that you reached a point where you were somewhat depressed mm-hmm. or sad, right? And I think a lot of people go through that, right? A lot yeah. of people might be um, dealing with mental hurdles with their job. But the thing is that I want to commend you on is that you took action, right? You mm-hmm. weren't just struggling. You weren't just sad. You actually did something. So what message would you have to people that feel like, all right, I'm not at a high point in my life right now. I don't know what to do. I have yeah. to get out of my situation what message would you have for them that could hopefully lead them to actually take action on their frustration? Well, I mean, the, the reason you're in this low point is because obviously your situation, things around you, like it's just not going the way you want it to go. Right. And there has to be a trigger there somewhere. For me, my trigger was I was, I had kids, I had a wife and I realized if I died, there's nothing left for them because corporate ain't going to keep paying me. I don't work there no more. They ain't going to take care of my family. You know what I'm saying? So for, for, for those people that are feeling that way, there's a trigger. There is something there that is causing you to feel that way. What is that? Okay, let's say it's like, well, my job's not paying me enough. Okay, how can we fix that, right? Or man, I really just, I wish I could start, you know, ballet dancing. I don't know. Okay, cool. Where is there a ballet place or center near you where you can start that? Or you can go on YouTube and start to learn. The point is like, you need to identify like what exactly is that thing? Because what's going to happen is that thing is going to turn into your why. And once you once you get into whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's whatever financial journey you get on or personal journey, there's going to be a why behind it. Everybody's always going to ask you, hey, what is your why? Discover your why. And that's what I did. Right. When I when I realized why I was feeling that way, that was my why. And that's still my why to this day. Why I keep getting up every day. You know, every day ain't sweet. Right. Every day is not not fun. But the dope thing is you can pull back on that place you were at 
and realize, well, this is why I'm here because I'm, I'm really trying to do this thing for these people or for this reason. Um, and, and to your point, as far as taking action, like, like uh, I used to play football, right? And they would say like, slow feet don't eat. And main, re- main thing they were saying is like, look, if, you just, if you're just sitting there, you're not moving around, you're not doing anything, then nothing's going to happen, right? It's literally insanity where you're doing the same thing over and over, which is nothing and expecting something to happen. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to give you a handout. Nobody's going to feel bad for you. So you have to actually decide to get up off your butt, get up off the couch or, or whatever it is and just get to it, right? Once you start moving around, things will happen. Things will start to shake out. Your mood will change. You'll feel productive. You'll feel like you're being validated because of whatever it is you're doing is probably going to reap some fruits from that labor. Um, and that's really what you just got to do. You just got to get out there and get to it. Um, but first off, again, identify what is making you feel that way and make that your why and then push forward so you don't have to go back to that place again. Yeah. And your why, I, I like that. Your why is, is very important um, because at some point, certain things slow down, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you talk about not every day is going to be good, right? You're not nope. going to make a lot of money every single day. You know, your business or whatever isn't always going to do well. A post you might throw on Instagram isn't always going to do well. Um, no. You're over, we're, we're human beings, right? We, we have emotions. And so I think your why should be the one thing that kind of keeps you going. Uh, mm-hmm. But the thing is too, and I want to tell everyone out there going off that is you had children as your why, right? So you had to pretty much get it done. It, it's different when you're thinking about other mouths to feed, right? Mm-hmm. And for people that don't have children, I always say like, you're in an era where like you can make, you know, or take so many different risks, right? You exactly. can fail, like it's okay to mess up. If you mess up on some, you just gotta worry about yourself, mm-hmm. right? But when you, you have to do these things before you have a family. So that way, once you reach that point, it's a little bit easier, right? And I can't say this yes. as a person who isn't a parent, but if I had to guess, <laughs> you probably have more time to yourself when you don't have children, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so for people, when you do have that and reach that point in your life, it's like, all right, now is, you know, even more um, motivation, which is good, fighting your why. Yep. Um, but talk to me too, right? When, when you mentioned just the overall family aspect and obviously people living in mobile homes, um, yeah. not necessarily what got you into it, into it, but why mobile homes? You know, why, why not, you know, a car wash? Why not <laughs> um, get into the trucking industry? What was it about mobile homes specifically that you said, you know what? This is what I want to rock with. It felt close to home, man. Like, like I said, beyond getting into it, because like, like I said, the, the traditional real estate just didn't, it just didn't jive with me. Um, it just felt so close to home because the one thing as a kid, like when I was younger, I was like, man, like we, we did live in a house at one point, but it was like literally like, oh, well, this is all you could afford. You didn't, we didn't want to live there. Like you didn't choose like, oh, I want this house. It was literally all you could afford. You know what I mean? So um, the mobile homes was more like, man, this is like an opportunity to to show people like, hey, here's what you can't afford. Like, I mean, quite frankly, the, the biggest misconception is that they're just, you know, little trash boxes, right? Like not. You can walk in some of them and you literally wouldn't even know it's a mobile home. You'd think it's an actual regular house because they can be that nice. Um, and I just saw where I could actually step in again, shifting that mindset of some of these families to where it's like, hey, you have X amount of dollars. That's not going to be able to get you a house, but those same dollars can get you a property, a mobile home property, sometimes a property with some land. And the point is creating that ownership, right? Like, like the mindset has to shift to look, you need to own something, right? Because again, it's going to be that pride of ownership that's going to kick in. So now that they have this mobile home, whether it's on land or in a park, the point is they own it. Now they feel, they don't feel, uh, it's like a, it's like a, a a bump in their confidence, right? Because now they don't feel like, man, I'm just some, you know, Section 8 kid or I'm just some poor person. or I'm just some person who lives in a mobile home. It's like, no, you are a homeowner. You're a homeowner. And then there's many, like I said, they move on to sell them and leverage them to then go into that single family, traditional, whatever you want to call it. But the point is, like, when I saw them and I see some of these children or some of these families, I saw me. I saw my mom. I saw my sister. I saw us. Like riding around, you know, Atlanta or or I should say East Atlanta, you know, I'm already out there hating on everybody. So <laughs> East Atlanta or whatever, um, riding around looking for places that we could afford. And I'm like, I see them and I'm like, hey. And so I'm like basically waving the flag over here like, hey, hey, hey over here, I got something you can afford. Let's just change the way you think about it, because you got to again, you got to look long term. You got to look long term. Like you said, if you can do set some of these foundations before you have children, it is, it's going to change everything once you do have kids. So imagine, you know, if, again, you're that person that's like, I can't afford anything, 
somebody comes along or you yourself change your mindset a little bit and think more long term, have a bigger picture and say, you know what, let me go over here and do this instead. Because right now, that's good enough for me. That's cool. But again, I can leverage that later on down the road to do even bigger and better things. But you got to start somewhere. Um, So, yeah, I mean, really, it was just me. I just saw me in it and I saw a spot where I can comfortably make an impact and not again not have to feel bad about it because the last thing i want to do is do deals or sell homes or whatever to people and feel like i had to like price gouge them or something like that in order for me to make some money and i don't have to do that in this case yeah yeah i mean look you, you find an industry that you're good at and that you're passionate about that's a that's a pretty good combination you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. and obviously you have a reason behind it you know yeah. what i'm saying when you talk about your childhood and growing up and like that that just makes it um that much better uh but how would you say like someone could get started into mobile home investing. Like, do you, you don't have to live in either a mobile home or that specific um, home to actually be an investor, right? No, no. Nah. I mean, anybody can get started any type of, I mean, anybody can get started from anywhere, right? Um, the easiest way or one way is through YouTube, which a lot of people do. Go on there, Google mobile home investing, mobile home mentors. Um, I have a YouTube channel, Official B. Boyd. Um, you can check that out. But you can do it that way. Free education, right? Um, there's mentoring. Obviously, you can go with people for mentoring. I have one of those as well. But the point is, it's not difficult to get into it whatsoever. If anything, the hardest part is going to be, again, whoever's getting into it, their confidence. Much like traditional real estate, much like stock investing, much like any type of investing, when you first jump in, you're going to feel like you're a fish out of water. You're going to feel like you're, the, you're like, there's a million people doing it and you have no clue what to do or anything like that. Right. So I would say, yo, jump on YouTube. Um, and as a matter of fact, three things that you can do right now that is, that are super simple is literally go to YouTube just to get some general information. After that, find some mobile home parks near you, literally Google it, mobile home parks near me and start driving around those parks. So you can get familiar with what a home looks like, where they're located, kind of how communities are set up, et cetera. And then at that point, literally start finding some homes that are labeled for sale by owner and start calling them and having conversations. Um, it's as simple as that, right? Once you have a conversation, then usually that's going to take it to the next step of them saying, well, can you help me sell my home? And then, you know, from there, there's other strategies where you literally use no money um, and you can help them sell their home, but also make a profit in between. So, I mean, it's, it's really, really simple to get started. It's just really having that self-confidence in yourself to actually get out there and do something that you're uncomfortable doing. Do you remember uh, your first deal? Oh, yeah, for sure, man. I remember my first deal. Um, it was a few it was years ago at this point. But I remember it was a property in Royce City, Texas. Royce City, Texas is about uh, two hours north of me. And I remember I found it on Craigslist. So I went on Craigslist, did mobile home, found a guy looking to sell his home. And I hit him up like, hey, I work with buyers and sellers. Um, you know, mind if I come out and take a look at it? He was like, yeah, no problem. Come on. So I went out there, took a look at it. And then he was, I was like, you know, well, hey, I probably have some people who might be interested. Are you okay if I try to help you sell this home? He was like, hey man, I just want it off my land, no problem. Perfect. So we agreed to like a price of 20,000, I believe, right? He was like, hey, if you can find me anybody who will bring me 20,000, cool. And you just keep whatever, whatever's on top of that. So I was like, perfect, not a problem, right? So I went out the next day, I listed it on Craigslist, Facebook, et cetera. And my phone blew up. And again, this is my first deal. So I literally was like, oh, crap, what do I do now? You know what I mean? So um, I, I met with a couple of people. They went and viewed it. And I remember the it was on a Friday when I met with him. That Sunday morning, I met church. Somebody's in my inbox. Like, hey, man, I'll give you $21,000 cash. Right. So literally, I remember I agreed with him for 20. That person was going to hit me with 21,000. And I was like, all right, I'll take it. Right. Now, looking back, I would say, Brandon, you should have took that. You should have waited. Because right. you had other opportunities. But again, this is again where I go back to that, like that confidence and that fish out of water. I literally was like, look, I just want to deal because this is crazy. Like, I, you know, what I mean, and, and for me, that first deal was the confidence I needed to prove that this works. Like for some people, they say, man, that's just a thousand dollars. And I'm like, well, that thousand dollars required like two hours worth of work. And I know for a fact it works. Mind you, I didn't show the people the home. I sent them out there. I didn't go back out there. You know what I mean? So I was like, I only went out there twice to see it and to sell it. And that's it. So um, that, yeah, that was the first deal, man. I'm never going to forget that deal. Never. It got me to this point. Of course, of course, of course. And to your point too, I mean, whether the, the number, I won't say is irrelevant, 
but I can mm-hmm. just hear. And the fact that you close on the deal, the fact that you close on the deal is probably bigger than the equity number itself for the for first sure. deal, because it shows you that it's possible. And I mm-hmm. think a lot of people just need that one hit to That's really it. see like, okay, the number I got is cool, but the fact that I close on one deal, oh, I can, mm-hmm. I, I can just keep doing this and the number is going to change. Mm-hmm. But I think reaching that one point can be a struggle. So how long um, did it take you to get that deal? I know you said it took you two hours to close the deal, but how long um, was it in between time frame between when you first reached out or, or, or logged on? Literally, I reached out to him on like a Wednesday. And then I went to go see it on a Friday and then I sold it on the Sunday. So we talking four days? Basically, yeah. It was quick. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right, we got, we got, we got to zoom out there because you know that sounds not too good to be true, but there, I know there's more, there had to be more. In so, so let me ask it this way. Yeah. Between when you first started to learn about mobile home investing, when you first mm-hmm. got induced, introduced to it, when you first watched your first ever YouTube video on it, how about that? Yeah. Between yeah. when you closed out on a deal, what was that margin like? Uh, that was like 26, 27 days. Okay. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, From the first time I ever like heard about mobile home investing or anything like mm-hmm. that. Now, mind you, um, first time I ever heard about mobile home investing was, it was, we was at, matter of fact, we were at Christmas break at my parents' house. Me and my wife and my, my first son, we were at a Christmas break at my parents' house. So that was like, you know, late December. Mm-hmm. And I literally started mobile home investing the, the, the first week of January that year and then closed that deal out, you know, like 26 or so days later. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That's crazy, but less than a month. And it, and it, I, I say it's crazy, but in like a lot of it, sometimes it's just that simple. I feel like with certain things in life, all right, mm-hmm. you learn something, yep. apply the information, there you go, right? Like obviously yeah. there, there, there's, you know, certain I's that need to be dotted, T's need to be crossed, but for the most part, get the information, take mm-hmm. action, there you go. Um, and you said this was through uh, Craigslist? I found that deal through Craigslist, yeah. Okay. Do you ever, yeah. uh, what about uh, Facebook Marketplace? Do you look for uh, through that? I well? look for, well, at this point, quite honestly, I've built up my pipeline and, and my business to a point where, like, I don't need to look on no Craigslist. Mm-hmm. I will, though, right? Like, because like, the main thing is, again, we're talking about people that are getting started, right? Like, I'm, I'm to a point where I have a team. I still do deals myself for sure, for sure. But I have a team and, you know what I'm saying, we, we do things like that. But for people who are just getting started, you jump on Facebook, like, for sure, jump on Facebook. Um, the only problem I would say, which most people might not even tell you, but the most, the, one of the problems with Facebook is that at this point, you're going to run into either a lot of wholesalers, which are basically people doing what I did on that first deal, right? You're playing the middleman, um, or you're going to run into a lot of homes that are kind of already priced at market, right? And, and so therefore, there's not a lot of opportunity for you unless you're actually going to purchase the home, right? So I would, that's why I say, you know, things like, you know, you can go to Craigslist and still find deals here and there. You might have to you know, wade through it a bit, but you can still find some opportunity there. But if you can actually go to these communities, because what's going to happen is you're going to see there are homes that are for sale by owner, you know, big old sign out front and everything, but they're not actually listed anywhere on any sites or anything. Mm -hmm. And those people, most of them have no clue how to actually get it in front of people. And that's where you come in. That's where you can play that middleman because you're letting them know, you know what, I'm going to do all the work, right? Like, like you, you need people to come see it. I'm going to do that. You need people to handle, handle title transfer and stuff. I'm going to do that. My buyer is even going to pay my fee. Like that's the biggest thing with the wholesale is letting your sellers know, like, I'm not even going to charge you to do this. All you have to do is sign this agreement. So we know how much you need to get out of the deal. And then I'm going to obviously have my buyer and they're going to pay my wholesale fee. So I would say definitely leverage a Craigslist, leverage uh, what we call driving for dollars, which is driving around the mobile home communities and looking at homes that way. So that way you can be the first in front of them. Um, once you get on Facebook Marketplace, it's a little more dicey situation um, of trying to find actual real opportunity on there. Yeah. And so, too, with that first deal and just overall mobile home uh, going the wholesaling route, mm-hmm. do you need all of the buying price money up front? No. No, because, again, if you're if you're wholesaling, now, mind you, I, I do a bunch of different strategies, right? But wholesaling, right. especially for beginners, is the best because you don't need any money. You're literally just making an agreement with your seller of whatever price that they're looking for. Then you're going out there and you're finding a buyer willing to pay that plus whatever your wholesale fee is. It doesn't require you to have any money. The only thing you need is some gas and some time. That's it. Um, And that's the beauty of wholesaling because, again, you're not out of pocket. Your buyer is going to be the one paying for the home, right? So 
that's the that's why I tell people like start off with that. And the best part about it is you don't have to worry about, you know, things like rehabs and, you know, other things like that, where you have to tie up even more money. You're like, you don't have to worry about that. You're selling as is to, you know, the buyer that comes along and wants to purchase it. But how do I, like, how does, a, uh, you know, someone figure out the actual numbers, right? So got like- you, got you. All right, bet. So that's another thing with mobile homes is a little bit different, right? So a traditional, you can go to like the MLS or whatever and, hey, this comp sold for this Y, X, Y, Z, right? Um, for mobile homes, generally speaking, is best. That's when you can leverage your Facebook and see if you can find homes in the area that are generally similar to yours and you can leverage that price. Um, and other opportunities, there's, there's other sites like a mhvillage.com where they literally just sell mobile homes on there. Um, and those homes are oftentimes are retail price, right? And so there, therefore, you're going to understand like, okay, retail market is selling for XYZ. I usually try to price my homes a little bit below retail. So that way it's still a good deal um, and they sell a lot faster. But the point is you kind of understand what it's going for at that point. Now, beyond that, if you can't find any comps, anything like that, that's when I would say either lean on some other investors that are in the area and ask them, hey, like, what, what do these generally sell for? And never go for one opinion if you're going to lean on other investors, because some of them are going to be looking to purchase that home from you. So they're going to lowball you. All right getting multiple opinions. The other option is you can actually go out to like a Facebook marketplace, a Craigslist and do what we call like a test ad where you might take a couple pictures of the home or something similar, maybe not the exact home because you don't want nobody to poach it, but you put it out there for a price that you think might be comparable, might be, you know, worthwhile and see what kind of hits you get, see what kind of response you get and then go from there, you know? Um, But once you've done like two, three, four deals and as long as you kind of understood what you were doing, at that point, you know, you don't really need comps. You kind of understand already when you walk in, all right, I know what I can sell this for. I know what somebody will pay you for this um, and everything like that. So in certain conversations I've had with people on real estate wholesaling, um, some of them feel like the deals aren't done through necessarily the properties or even the numbers, but more so the people mm-hmm. in terms of finding out their specific situation in terms of some people are looking to sell immediately or some people mm-hmm. are looking to get rid of their home immediately. Do you think that's the same case for mobile home as well? For sure. I mean, that's, that's really what goes into the whole negotiation, right? Like if let's, let's just say, right. Um, base price for home X, we know generally sells for $15,000, you know, everything equal. Then we talk to seller and we realize, man, they need this, they need to sell this thing tomorrow and it needs to be moved. Right. Generally speaking to move a mobile home for like a single wide, it's going to cost you like 3,500 bucks. So off top, you already know, okay, you want a 15 grand, we're already going down. We're taking that 3,500 off because again, I have to make it appealing to my buyer, right? So the buyer is going to know this would normally sell for 15, but they've discounted it some, which builds in room for my move that I have to pay for, right? So that's off top, you know that. And then of course, once you talk to them, you obviously need to, I say you really need to spend time with your seller to, to actually talk to them, develop a relationship if you can, and really understand where they're coming from. Because sometimes it literally has nothing to do with them needing money. They just need to feel like they were heard and that they weren't taken advantage of. And then other times it's like, you know what? They actually need the funds. Like they need to move. They need these funds or else they're not going to have anywhere to go. And especially on those type of deals, those are ones where I'm like, you know what? You need to be very careful to not lowball them on those type of deals. Like try to get them as close to value as you can, while also obviously getting a commission that that'll work for you. Um, but those relationships are, are, I mean, yeah, they're critical because the sellers will oftentimes divulge some information. Maybe they're like, oh, yeah, I had to re- replace that toilet, you know, a month ago because it fell through the floor. And you're like, oh, crap. OK, I couldn't tell. But now that you told me that, I understand there might be some plumbing. So we're going to take my offers going even lower now. Right. So um, or you know what? That roof, I just put it on last month. Bet that actually increases the value of the home, mm-hmm. right? So there's all these type of things that sometimes you can't see, but through conversation. Right. And so do you have like a, either a mental or even a physical checklist that you kind of make sure you address? Like, all right, I need to make sure this is there, this isn't there, so on and so forth. Yeah. I mean, really, I have like a, a little profile sheet that I use, right? So every seller that calls in, I'm literally, like I even tell people, like literally use this profile sheet go down it line by line and ask them the questions or fill in those blanks. That'll pretty much take care of all the general information. And then from there, it's just inspection time. And there's an inspection sheet where you're going to go down that list and check things off and look at it. And the good thing about mobile homes is you don't have to be an expert, right? Like some of this stuff, 
you can literally look at like you can open up the the case to like a furnace or something and if you see a bunch of dust and it's du- and is is rusted and stuff you can kind of assume like all right there might be an issue there right like it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out right so it's literally just going down the list filling in the blanks checking off things and then from there if you're thinking you know what there's a few repairs i don't know about okay call a handyman and ask him what would he charge to fix it right so it's it's really really straightforward it's literally just follow the directions you'll be all right yeah and that was another thing i was going to ask too how important is it do you feel um to build and have a team because a lot of people that might be either struggling financially they'll probably have to start a journey on their own um and so obviously that can be good in terms of having mm-hmm. that ambition but if i had to guess you let me know if i'm incorrect in saying this at some point it's best to have people that you can ask questions whether it be through mentorship or just other folks who have been in this industry that you might need. Yeah, going at it solo is cool and it's cute. You know, a lot of people like to be like, oh man, I went at it solo. I never lost any money on deals, et cetera, et cetera. But that's all cap. You know, like you obviously need people. I'm just keeping it real, man. You no, need fine, people, fine. you know, in the space. I mean, I've been doing this for a while and there are still people I lean on who have been doing it longer than me, who haven't been doing it longer than me, or who haven't been doing it as long as me. And I still gain information and things from them, right? Like even a guy on my team the other day, he was telling me a new little thing he does with, with sellers and things like that. And I was like, oh man, I never thought of that, right? So it like, and things change, right? Like frankly, even for instance, in your spot with the NBA, over the years, things have changed as far as the way the game is played and positionless, you know, basketball and things like that. So you have to evolve with the times as well. And sometimes that means you need to talk to people who are now in the trenches or people who were there, you know, wherever, you know, years ago, because maybe that's where you're trying to go. So yeah, man, always leaning on other investors, um, whether they're in mobile home investing or real estate, because real estate does play a part in this as far as financing, things like that. Um, but the newer investors, I mean, they're innovative, right? They're, they always have new tips and tricks and new ways of finding opportunities and deals. And you might want to leverage that too, you know, so definitely lean on other people and their knowledge for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to be able and willing to adapt, right? Mm-hmm. And understand that you're not living the same times that you were years ago, even two weeks ago. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And also to your point, being willing to learn from any and everyone, mm-hmm. right? Being humble enough to know that like, you know, you, you're you never ever going to know 110% about something. You know what I'm saying? No. Like you have to be willing to to open your mind to other people's thoughts and opinions. Um, but in, in, in doing that though, did you ever notice um, regardless of the size of your team or anyone's team mm-hmm. that like there's some people that have been that are able to do it solo um and if so what type of specific um people are required on a team if that makes sense like do you need a contractor do you yeah. need um a realtor do you need um someone who can run numbers or, or things like that what is i guess a team actually look like so in regards to like my team we don't have contractors we don't have Number crunches, none of that stuff. It's literally other investors who really just didn't understand the game or were like just having a problem like getting footing. And I was like, well, look, I got so many leads and things like that that come in. I can't do them all. So bet, let's join forces and come to an agreement on on cuts and things like that, right? Now, ultimately, this is going to depend on like your setup. Like I do know other people who have teams of contractors, um, of people, you know, to go out there and crunch the numbers with finance guys and everything like that. So literally, it's going to depend on, like, what do you want your business to look like? And that's the beauty, frankly, of all real estate. It's not monolithic. You know, some people might do commercial. Some people might do, you know, multifamily. Some people might only focus on smaller multifamilies like duplexes. Some might just do houses, et cetera. We happen to do mobile homes. Um, So I would say, really, what do you want your business to look like? You can do it solo, but would you really want to scale? If you're looking at it like, you know what, I want to do this full time. I'm looking to make, you know, multi six figures. You're going to need a team of some sort, whether that's handymen and finance people, whether that's other uh, people that you train up under you to go out and start to handle some of these deals, or even if it's more of like a mentorship type thing and y'all kind of exchange information and kind of bounce, you know, bounce off of each other and help each other's businesses grow. You really need to understand, like, what exactly do you want your business to look like? You know, me personally, um, I don't do. I do fix and flips, but that's not like I don't strictly only do that. So therefore, I have a contractor I work with, but he's not on my team because I don't need him on retainer or anything like that. You understand? So again, that's where it's just like I would say personally, have tons of contacts, 
but don't bring don't bring people on the team unless it fits your long term you know goal and vision. Mm. And so you mentioned fix and flip, right? Mm-hmm. And I know you've talked about wholesaling before, but what are the are those the two biggest or only ways that can really um, someone can get involved with mobile home investing, wholesaling, um, and fix and flip? Nah, let's see. <laughs> so there's a bunch. There's a bunch, man. There's obviously wholesaling. That's the no money strategy where you don't use any of your own money. You play the middleman, connect the two, and make money in between. Um, you have fix and flipping, which you know you're going to purchase the home, fix it, and resell it. You have owner financing, which is basically the cash flow aspect of it, where you're going to purchase a home. Sometimes you might fix it. Sometimes it might be as is. You'll sell it to whomever, and they're going to pay you, you know, monthly until they pay it off, right? Like you, you play the bank in that situation, right? So you're not a landlord. You're just playing the bank. Um, you have other situations where people rent them out. That's becoming a huge, huge thing now where they're literally working with like government agencies that are placing people in these homes and the government basically is cashing you out. Right. But they're renting out these homes. Um, You have other people that use, use them for like group homes. You have other people I know that are setting up, especially out in like more rural communities. They're starting to set up like Airbnb type or like family um, reunion, like type spots, you know, with a bunch of attractions around it in their little small little niche community. So, I mean, honestly, if, 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 if any way you can think of, you can really make money off these things. There's so many ways to cut this thing. Um, the rental, the, the, the rental spin that they've put on it with the agency thing was something that has started to become a little more popular. Um, the group home thing as well. Um, honestly, there's some people I know, especially out in West Texas, where the oil is really, really big, you know, a lot of oil fields and things like that. Oil. They got people out there where, where they got like, you know, it's one huge mobile home, but it's like four different units. It looks like one mobile home, but it's four different units and they're renting them out by the room mm-hmm. out in these oil fields and whatnot. So, I mean, it's crazy. It's, 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 it's ridiculous. Yeah. There's a, there's, it sounds like there's a lot of ways. Um, the thing is though, right. When there's different opportunities in that, can some of this be done virtually? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. You, th- you said that, um, you know, so again, talking about networking, there's a young lady who actually did a deal today where it was virtual and she made $20,000 profit. It was a home plus land. You know, so yeah, it can be done virtually. Um, one thing I would say if you do it virtually is, you know, what we call boots on the ground, have somebody local, right? And mainly it's, it's, not, it's less about um, having them local to go view the home and more about them helping to maintain that relationship with the seller. Like, let's say you're working virtually and something happens where the seller is spooked or maybe somebody needs to come see the home. So, you know, you'd, you'd like to have a third party there just to answer any questions or possibly intercept if you need to or whatever, Like, it's good to have somebody there that you're comfortable with, because at the end of the day, this is a business transaction and just keeping it all the way frank with you, you can try to, you know, sell somebody's home or whatever. But if you connect two people outside of you and they decide to do a deal, you can go after them. But I mean, it's going to cost you probably more money and time than than is necessary. Mm -hmm. Right. So is in my opinion, it's best to still have somebody local to kind of play the middleman um, if you're not going to be there physically. And really, again. You can work with another investor or anybody there locally. And they'll, a lot of times they'll do it for you for the low, you know, just, hey, kick me a small percentage and I'll do what you need me to do, right? Because again, they're just looking at, you're giving me an opportunity. So they'll usually take it. So how do you like, how do you find two things? One, boots on the ground, as mm-hmm. well as investors slash buyers. So what, like one thing that I've thought about is um, thinking in reverse. So mm-hmm. like thinking of people that you already know in different cities around the country now obviously i mean like the market might change in terms of numbers and things like that but of course you know someone that might make your job a little bit easier but how do you go about finding um boots on the ground as well as investors that might be ready to purchase that property so as far as purchasing i'll start with that first purchasing me personally i sell it to anybody it can be an investor it can be an end buyer it can be a park owner it could be it could be a freaking dealer right like it doesn't really matter who I'm selling it to. The only thing that might change in that situation is how, like the speed at which I need to sell it. Mm-hmm. Right. Like if you're like, look, I need to sell this thing tomorrow. Then I might go reach out to an investor or um, I might reach out to a dealer or somebody like that because I know they have cash ready and they're ready to move right now. And you know, the only thing with that though, is sometimes you might have to take a little haircut, but the point is the deal got done. Right. Um, but as far as finding buyers again, like the easiest way, if you're just looking for general buyers, is posting it on all the classified sites. So again, it's the Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, eBay. Yes, eBay does still work. So just different spots like that. As far as investor buyers, that's where you come into contact with like networking 
you can literally find Facebook groups that focus on mobile homes, um, go to real estate meetups. You're starting to see more mobile home investors in those spots, right? Um, and really just networking with those people. And two things is going to happen. One, you're going to get your name out there. So people are going to know like, oh, man, that's this, man. He be selling like crazy homes. Man, I got to work with that guy, right? They, they, they build up that no like trust factor. Secondly, you actually find investors and, and investors, even within that niche, they're different. Some investors are strictly looking to wholesale. Some are strictly looking to buy and hold. Some are actual investors where they're like, look, I just want to lend money. I don't even care about the home. I just want to see what the numbers look like and lend some money on it, right? So you start to differentiate like who is about what action, right? And then of course, when it comes to finding boots on the ground, now let's say you know four or five investors in that state, city, area, wherever you're looking at. But now because you've been talking to people, you've been kind of around a little bit, you can kind of assess, you know what? Investor ABC is cool, but investor D is who I need to work with because I, I, I have a better rapport with them. Maybe I trust them a little bit more, whatever the case may be. Again, going back to that point where I said, never go with your first option, always have multiples. It's the same thing with investors. You got to have multiples because, I mean, don't get it twisted. Like the, the investment game is cool, but they will, they will screw you in a minute, right? So you need to work with people that you trust um, and that kind of understand, you know, how you're operating and how you do business. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to your point, too, about the social media portion, I think people kind of sleep on Facebook groups and the amount yeah. of information yeah. that there's out there on, you know, Facebook, overall Instagram, Discord groups, LinkedIn, like the information mm -hmm. is definitely there. Um, and I always say like information is very similar to food and like there's different groups of it, right? Mm -hmm. there, like you, you can go on Instagram and follow a bunch of people that are talking about relationships. Yeah. You can follow a bunch of people that's talking um, about sports. Mm -hmm. Follow a bunch of people that's talking about real estate stocks, so on and so forth. Exactly. It's your job to go out and find them, and it's really, it really doesn't even take that much time. Like Facebook, <laughs> not is at all. So easy. Like literally, go to facebook.com, type in real estate investing groups, mobile home investing groups, stock market mm -hmm. groups, and I promise you, you know, what I'm saying Litany. you can join them. Um, mm -hmm. But so, did, were you ever kind of hesitant? And I'm sure you were, like just overall aware of like, all right, I can't take information from everybody, right? Because yeah. sometimes free. And always good, right? So, no. uh, but did you actually kind of think twice to just make sure that all right, here's some information that I've received, but let me make sure I double check on you know that it's all accurate. I mean, frankly, what I did is I I mean, I said, look, when I when I first started and want to get into it, I did the YouTube route. And mind you, when I said I did the YouTube route, that was more so just to get like some foundational education, like okay, what exactly is this? How does it work, etc. I immediately started looking for mentors though. I immediately was like, look. I'm trying to take the shortcut, right? And, and frankly, at that time too, financially, I was very stable. So I had the funds to pour into like really good mentorship. And that's what I received. Um, and that really just cut the time in half. And then as far as information count comes, the dope part about it was the community around um, the program I was in, which, you know, I'm now I'm, I got my own thing or whatever, but the, the community in the mobile home space is dope because now I could lean on those who had been doing it much longer than me especially in my area. So now I can say, Hey, I got this situation. Like, how would you handle that? How do I handle that? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start to develop relationships with people and you kind of understand like, okay, that person, they're cool, but they might kind of beat around the bush a little bit. That person right there, like they all the way, they all the way with it. Right. And that's the biggest thing I would tell somebody like the free, like you said, free isn't always good. Free is only going to get you, but so far, right? Like free will get you to the door, but it ain't going to get you in. You got to know somebody to get in that door. Usually. And knowing somebody is, i.e., the mentor or, and again, it don't always have to be paid. Like there are people who will gladly help you from the side of their desk or for instance, like my team, right? They didn't pay me or anything like that. We just worked together and I helped them. It was an exchange, right? It was a value exchange. Hey, I'm going to give you all information. I'm going to give you all some leads. I'm going to show you exactly like how to figure this thing out. So y'all can actually get your business going mm -hmm. in exchange. I'm going to need your time so you can work some of these leads, et cetera. So it works out, right? So people can do that as well. You can just be like, look, I don't have any money to give you, but I'm totally willing to give you my time if you teach me, right? So there's a bunch of ways to skin a cat. Don't always think you have to pay for mentorship or something like that. But the point is, I would always say, like, you need to bring some value to the table because that's the only way you're going to receive value. You're not going to, like, you can watch all the YouTube videos and there's going to be gaps. I guarantee it. Or you're going to run into a bunch of people, again, that's lying about some stuff or they're, they're even a little off in their information. So it's like, ah, eh, that doesn't work in your state. Or that doesn't work in your area or we don't do it that way anymore. Um, so I would say 
definitely, 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 definitely find some people that you can lean on, give them some value, and they'll give you it to you in return. They definitely will, but you have to give some value too. Like nobody's going to give it to you for free. And having mentors definitely, you know, the, the makes the learning curve a lot smoother. Because again, mm -hmm. YouTube and information and absorbing content is definitely important, right? Yeah. It might get you to where you want to go temporarily, uh, but eventually it definitely helps to have someone that's gone through it. For um, sure. And you know, the best way to receive value is to provide value. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to be a person that people want to work with, right? Like give yep. people a reason. Because nowadays a lot of people like to ask for stuff. Yeah. Like, hey, oh yeah, they be in the inbox is heavy. Yeah, and you got to remember this is a two-way street. You know what I'm saying? People mm -hmm. are busy. People got money to make. You know what I'm saying? If you just someone that's asking without providing anything in return, and it don't even have to be money. That's the crazy part. Huh? Yeah. But if some sort of value has to be given if you're expecting value to be returned. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's a great, great point though. So we talk about mentors and things like that. So um, do you, are there any um, apps that you prefer to use or is it just, you know, go- Nah, forward? man, there's no, there's no like, you know, fame, no little cute apps and like that, bro. Like literally Facebook, man. Like Facebook is so powerful. Facebook and Google, we all got smartphones, like leverage the power of that, right? Like for instance, you know, going back to the whole buyer situation. Yeah. I have a buyer's group that I, that I have, and it's 15,000 buyers deep, right? So rarely am I even needing to go out of it. I'm just posting it in there, right? Or my own personal buyer's list that I have off to the side. So, but that was all literally leveraged off of Facebook and Google, right? That's it. Um, so leverage that, you know? And of course you got YouTube on the side and that's for the educational piece. But I mean, nah, man, you don't need any apps, man. It's all literally at your fingertips, right? And then as you get more experience, you start to learn more, you start to, you know, know more then you can branch out and maybe start to create like your own space, you know, yeah. but for now, leverage all the free resources that you can um, to, to help build up your business and gain your own confidence before you start doing other things that you're going to have to pay for. Facts, 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 facts. And that was a flex. I was, I was hoping you were going to say something about that. The idea of having 15,000 kind of buyers <laughs> readily available before you mentioned the flex about the job, which I was definitely down for, but this one definitely too. I'm gonna, I'm make sure that people, you know what I'm saying? Hear that part too. And just overall being prepared um, of having buyers readily available, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's uh, start from the top, right? Let, let's let's to, to kind of put it all into perspective, right? Sure. Let's say I'm a person who's getting ready to start investing in mobile homes, right? Um, and I just watched this video, <laughs> but now what? What what is, what is the next step, right? I I I I um I go on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. how, how about how about I, how about I walk through it, right? You let me know. You know what I'm For saying? sure. All right, bet. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So I go to Facebook. Dr. Mm -hmm. Boys, Facebook Craigslist. Go to Facebook, man. Start off with Facebook. Facebook. All right. I go Everybody Facebook. got a Facebook. Right, right. Facts, facts, facts. I go to Facebook, right? I join um, a mobile home investing group or do I go sure. to a marketplace? Go to Facebook, find a mobile home investing group to join. Okay. Jo join the group. Join the group. All right. Now I'm scrolling through all the previous posts. I'm learning. I'm, you know, continuing to educate myself on the field. I now, after let's say a day or two, a week or whatever, right, feel like I know enough to really jump into the industry. My right. next step, right, would be to uh, drive for dollars. Yeah. Right? Or actually, 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 no. You mentioned go to Google and look up mobile home parks near you. Find the parks first. Yes. Find, find the parks. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. See. Go to Google. So, go to Google. Okay. Then. Um, mobile home, mobile home parks near you. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. Go there. You drive around. Now, is it literally just that simple in terms of looking for any types of mobile homes or like? Cause you know, I know like in um a certain property, you look for like pre foreclosures. Um, yeah. No, nah, man. In okay. this case, it's different. It's as simple as that. It's okay. as simple okay. as that because again, the biggest thing with driving for dollars is we're looking to drive these parks and find the for sale by owner signs. Okay. The status of the home, we'll figure all that out later. We don't care. We just trying to get in that door because we know you're trying to sell and we're trying to prevent you, present you an opportunity. Okay. And when you're driving for dollars, is that all you're looking for? Just a sign that says for sale by owner? In the beginning, in the beginning, if you're new, look for that because it's exactly. obvious as you get more seasoned, it becomes again, like this is where real estate and mobile homes are very like synonymous. You're going to start to look for those distressed properties. You got trash cans out front that look like they ain't been emptied in forever. You got broken mm -hmm. windows. Those are the ones, those are the gold mines. Cause you're like, look, they probably abandoned. They'll give it to you for nothing. Right. But in the beginning, look for four sub owner signs. Yeah. That's so crazy what certain people get excited by, you know, like as an investor, <laughs> like, oh, is that a is that a better property? That might, you know what I'm saying, might be a, you know what I'm saying? Hey man, if it looked like it used to be a meth house, it's probably that's where <laughs> that's where you want to be at. 
Like, yo, let me get up <laughs> And that's in crazy. There. And that's crazy to think, like, oh, there's opportunity. And one thing, like, that I realized, realized too, like, driving for dollars is sometimes the best day to do it um, is on trash day. Mm-hmm. You know, because if certain people don't have their trash out, but everyone yeah. else on the street does, and on top of that, the property doesn't look like someone's living it, you might just stump it up. You know, you're, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm a. I'm, hey, you're I'm right. A, no, you're right. <laughs> like, like real estate and and mobile homes are very synonymous in a lot of ways. A lot of the same strategies do work. The difference yeah. is, for one, the opportunity, finding the opportunity, like good opportunity, is very different. Mm. And so, yeah, facts, but opportunity. And so, I mentioned driving for dollars. You mentioned looking for that for sale by owner. But what about virtually? Is it a, a Google Maps thing, or is it the same process of? you know, um, going to Facebook, join the groups, how would the, the, the search for the properties look? Online? So if you're doing it, if you're doing it virtually, then in that case, obviously you want to identify whatever market virtually you're trying to do it in. Again, preferably one where you have somebody, but if it's literally like, Hey, I have nobody, it's just straight virtual. And you don't want to spend any money like using like ads and things like that to drive people to you. Then in that case, yeah. Leverage a Facebook leverage, a like Craigslist, um, leverage newspapers, um, leverage public notices like every state has some type of public notice usually by county um, you can find crazy deals there as well like auction houses and things like that leverage those and the one difference i would say especially if you're getting started out and you're like hey i just want to do it virtually then you actually need to start at the end of the process you need to be focused on finding buyers right because that way since it's virtual you already know you know what i have i have billy and he's looking for a three bedroom single wide in Savannah, Georgia. All right, bet. Now, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to look for homes, but I'm really going to be looking for this so I can show Billy and he can buy it and we can be in and out and be good to go. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and then again, that helps you quick turnover and then less hands on. Okay. Okay. And let's say too, even with that example, you've now found a property, right? You, you mm-hmm. just identify it because it looks like no one is living there or yeah. whatever. I'm um, or has it for sale by owner, you find a property, Let's say you schedule an appointment, which I think, okay, that it's pretty easy, y'all. Just contact the person. Yeah. Um, well, what I'll say is don't leave that community until you call that person. Mm-hmm. Call them. Don't don't wait to get home. Don't wait to get home to call them. The reason is because you're going to have somebody like me who's going to come take that home from you. That's, that's why. Wow. Like, I'm going to that's call tough. them while I'm there. <laughs> right? There's so many times where I've called and I'm like, hey, John, like I see you got a, a for sale bone. Are you selling your home? Yeah. All right. Cool. He's like, who's that? I'm like, that's me. Can I come in and take a look at the home? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, that's why I say call them immediately because what happens is again, we're talking about opportunity. The first person through the door usually is going to get the deal. That's usually what's going to happen. So you want to call them immediately. Plus it's fresh on your mind. Like what happens if you wait until Wednesday and then it snows or it rains or you get sick, your kids got something to do. You got to stay late at work. They're going to find somebody else. Yeah. So do it immediately. Mm. But what if, what if their phone number isn't like, what if there isn't a for sale by owner sign and, but you could tell the property is a little, you know, needs attention. How do you go about contacting them outside of the obvious knock on the door approach? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, can, you, you can leave something on the door if you want. Like I've done that many times. I'll leave like a business card or something like that on the door. Uh, one of the slick ways you do it is you actually get like, um, you can go to the post office and get it for free. Like one of those express priority envelopes put it in there and sit that by the door. Cause they're going to think, Oh crap. Somebody, somebody left some mail for me. Nah, it's just my card. Hey, call me. I got, I got a deal for you. Right. Mm. The other option is you can go to the park office, actually go to the park manager and say, Hey, I saw you had a home over there on three Oh five Dover street. Right. Uh, is there something going on? Like she's empty. Oh, yada, yada, yada. Sometimes they'll tell you, sometimes they might play hard. Like, it, yeah. but the point is like, you have to go try. And then lastly, uh, what you could actually do is find the address of that home look it up with the county. If you look it up, then either A, you'll see the owner's name and maybe an actual mailing address. I would send them some mail. Mm-hmm. Or B, if it goes dr- still to that same address, I'm still going to send a piece of mail because they might still be checking the mailbox. Mm-hmm. Or if you want to take it a step further in, in a paid route, then you could look into some skip tracing. Again, the crossover with residential or traditional and, and mobile homes, you can look into skip tracing or something like that. And uh, see if you can find the phone number and hit them up that way. Yeah. 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 Um, so basically figure out a way to contact the seller, right? Obviously, mm-hmm. you find the, the Exhaust all options. Mm-hmm. Exhaust them all. Because, again, that 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 total of an hour, two hours you're going to take to exhaust all those options could net you five-figure, you know, payday. Yeah. So exhaust all options. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's worth it, too. Because, like, to your point, 
um, to, to what you said previously, someone came up off a $20,000 deal. And the thing mm-hmm. is, too, I feel like with, within these situations, it's one deal, right? We're, like, we're not talking about a $20,000 um, salary increase. No. Right? We're not talking about, you know, $20,000 um, payment spread across, you know, months. We're talking about, you know, it's yours right Love now. Some. Yep. You know? um, but so, okay, so let's say, right, <laughs> you've seen the property. Um, let's say, you, you know, you took pictures, whatever, whether it was you, your boots on the ground person, whatever. You took pictures, right? You have the pictures back at your own house or hmm, I'm trying to think. All right. So let's, let's say you take pictures, right? And now you're, you're in the mobile home with the owner, right? And you negotiate, do you negotiate price right then and there? Do you not waste time? You just. Yeah. Negotiate the price right then and there, right then and there. How do you know a number right then and there though? Like, is it because I know it from experience, me personally, Hmm. I know it from experience. Now what I would tell somebody is if they're brand new, they know nothing, right? Try to get a number out of them. Try your hardest to get a number out of them. So at least you know a starting point. At least you know a starting point, right? So let's just say, we'll, we'll go with both scenarios. Scenario one, you get a number out of them. They're like, hey, I want 15,000. Like, okay, all right, John. Um, we'll see if we can make that work. But John, let me let me go back real quick, talk to my partners to see if that's a number we can actually make work. Um, do you mind if I call you in about an hour? All right, yeah, yeah, that'll work. Take your butt either home immediately or jump on your phone immediately and start trying to run those comps like we talked about earlier via Facebook, Craigslist, Mobile Home Village, et cetera, right? And then hit them back. And if you say an hour, try to hit them back in 45 minutes. Don't don't wait the whole hour, right? And then, you know, either lock the deal down or you let them know, you know what, here's what we're seeing. And then, you know, you go from there, right? To renegotiate that number. And then obviously you want to sign the, the agreement, the wholesale agreement, if that's what you're doing. Now, if you can't get a number out of them, right? You let them know, okay, well, I mean, all right, that number, we were you know, trying to find like a baseline for you because I know you want to sell this home. We're trying to help you out, but let me do this. Again, hit them with the same thing. Let me go back and talk to my partners real quick um, because we really like to have a number, but since we don't, let us go run some numbers and I'll tell you what we can do for you. Does that sound good? Yeah, yeah that'll work. And again, same hour, whatever you go run it. Because honestly, it shouldn't take you no more than like 10, 15 minutes to really run some numbers, you know? And that's why I say, you go to your car and do it. I didn't say go home, go to your car and do it. So that way, hopefully you can knock back on that door and get the whole agreement and everything done um, right then and there. Because the idea is when you walk in that door, you're walking out with an agreement. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny too, to hear you say, you know, you tell the seller, like, let me go and talk to my partners. When in reality, it, for some people it might just be. Might just be you. you know, my phone. Well, technically speaking, your partners is everybody on Facebook putting up homes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they don't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> they need to know that. That's not their business. All I'm saying is, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Then, then we go talk to, you know, some people and we're going to make work. So, all right. So let's say, right, you come to agreement, fast forward, you get the number, right? Um, mm-hmm. What exactly, um, let's say the number is 20,000, right? You and the seller are not in group. And let's say this is a, a, a wholesaling. Yeah. Right. Let's say this wholesale. You get the number for $20,000. You both come to an agreement, the contract, right? I'm not sure. Um, where can people, and I'm not sure if you offer this or have some that you provide, but where, where would I find a contract? And where would. Honestly, like if you're, if like, so like if you're in my program, you get it. But if you're not, and you're just looking like on the internet or something, um, you can go to like the eforms.com. I know they have a ton of contracts on there and, and you just basically fill in the options and it'll give you the pre-filled, you know, agreement. Um, again, these Facebook groups and things like that, a lot of them will have the agreements in them. And Yeah. In the in in the file section, and I'm not saying I'm having the mobile uh, mobile home game, but I've just noticed in a lot nope, of that's Facebook, where it's at. You're right. Yeah, the file section, y'all. Gems are being dropped, y'all. But the yes. file section of Facebook freebies that might be that area might Loki be more powerful than just the post, just because mm-hmm. that's the part that's already there, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, people aren't uploading files unless it's very very high level exactly. of, of importance, right? When you scroll through posts. Some people got questions that you already know the answers to. Some mm-hmm. people are just introducing themselves and it's all valuable. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but that files area is top tier. Um, hey man, the files are dope because you're going to have stuff that's been there for, for years and you might find something like, oh, yeah. I, I thought I didn't know we even had this here. Yeah. You know, you might, I mean, you can find like free eBooks and stuff in these file sections sometimes. So yes. yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, cool. So we, get, so we got the contract. Let's say the two of you agree, right? And we can skip the formalities of what's in it because yeah. like I said, Google is your friend, y'all. Just exactly separate. All right. <laughs> so we got the contract, right? Um, we agree for 20000 Now you have X amount of days to find a buyer, right? So now 
the minute that's agreed, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a, um, if it's submitted um, like online or like, um, what's the app I'm thinking of? DocuSign or, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, me and my team, we do DocuSign. All of our agreements, we do DocuSign for 30 days because at this point we're closing all our deals out within seven days. Okay, so we, we don't need more than 30 days. Say that, say that, say that. So within that seven day, we got we got a week, right? You find a buyer, um, you go probably, if I had to guess, to these same Facebook groups and say, hey, y'all, I have this deal. Right? And again, this is aside from the people that you already know, just speaking from hey. a beginner's perspective. Hey, y'all, I got this deal for $20,000. You let me know if you're interested. Here's a folder of all the pictures, right? Mm -hmm. You can probably... You know, go to what Dropbox or Google Drive to upload yeah, something the like that. Yeah. Then the link, bada bing, bada boom. You find someone who wants to buy it for, in your case, your first deal, twenty one thousand dollars, and <laughs> yep. you make a thousand dollars off <laughs> your first deal, right? And then yep. do you send them another? Um, do you send the? What do you send the buyer after you come? So the buyer. So the buy. Once it's all said and done, basically you're going to send the buyer your purchase agreement, right? That's the first thing I'm sending the purchase agreement to be like, hey, let's go ahead and get this down and eat that you're actually going to buy this home, and I'm usually collecting my deposit then. Now, the deposit is going to be your wholesale fee, whatever that fee is, right? So that way you lock in your money. You're locking it in, right? Then at that point, either A, y'all can close on the spot and, you know, bill of sales and bada bing, you're done. Um, or B, you can do it another day, right? And this is where, this is where like working with people and coaching comes in handy because situations are different, right? Like for instance, if I'm doing a wholesale deal, like I made um, 19,000 on the wholesale not too long ago. I'm gonna, I want to keep my seller and my buyer a little bit separate. Right. The seller was cool, but like, yeah, let's keep them separate. It's different once you see the money in person. You know what I mean? Why is that though? Why do you want to keep them separate? Well, because what happens is you got to remember we're in the, we're in this mobile home space and it's looked at differently from everybody to a sense. Right. So what they, what happens is, so for instance, in traditional real estate, you might do like what 6% or something like that is what the, the, the Realtor. broker normally, normally gets. Right. So they're looking at it like, why aren't you getting 6%? And it's like, uh, well, again, this okay. is a wholesale deal, right? This isn't a broker deal. And then two, I'm playing both sides of this. I'm not doing one side, right? There's nobody else that's coming to take care of the title transfer and all that. Like I'm doing both sides of this thing. And again, it was a wholesale deal, right? So, and again, like I tell people, um, whatever the agreement price is, that's why I say get a number from them. I'm allowing them to do the driving, right? Because at the end of the day, they're not going to feel like you, you pulled their leg or pulled the rug out from under them. And then again, like I said, because of that dollar value, like, I don't know what it is, but I found over time, like once you hit five figures, if it's 10K or more, people start to feel a type of way. You know what I mean? Even though you gave them exactly what they wanted. Let's say they said, I wanted 50,000. You gave them 52,000 and you walked away with 13. They're going to be like, well, why ain't I getting another eight? Mm -hmm. It's like, but like literally you told me you wanted 50. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I, I get it. The, the greed part comes into play, but at the same time, it should be like, don't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? We agreed to a number. People may feel like, all right, I shouldn't be paying you more. Mm -hmm. If you were able to finesse or get a better deal mm -hmm. from someone else, but it, you know, as a middleman, regardless, it's like, that's not any of your business, right? Don't worry about it. But that's it. why, you know, that's why I tell people like, if you don't get no agreement, there is no deal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, mm -hmm. you need to get it in paper. And, and like when I tell my sellers, I'm like, literally we're doing this agreement to protect both sides. I can't come back and tell you that you told me a lower number. You can't come back and tell me that you said higher. It's literally us on paper. And I get them notarized as well, right? So we all legit. Um, but again, like to each his own, how you do it. Um, but yeah, literally you can close that day, separate day, whatever. It's up, really up to you. Um, bill of sales, you know, um, purchase agreements. And that's that's pretty much it. You hand over the title. Um, if you're in a state like Texas where it's electronic, you fill out an application, mail it in to Texas Department of Housing. They take care of the rest from there. I mean, it's really, really simple. You can purchase a home and sell it literally within the same hour if you want to. It's super simple. Think of it like an automobile. That's literally how they're titled, like an automobile. Hmm. Well, there you go. I mean, hmm. we just, you know, that, that I think that was a very, very good segment. I'm going to give myself time to back, <laughs> you know, because I think the idea, because sometimes obviously when we talk about things like this and the information is good, but I think it's important to have the rundown, like, all right, start here, mm -hmm. do this, do this, do this, so on and so forth. Um, so thank you for that. Um, no but problem. thinking from the beginning um, of your story, right, going back to, um, you know, growing up in the single parent house or being, you know, with your first job um, out of college, being one that you were uh, making more than your mom and now being a man, a father um, mm -hmm. of three sons, and now just putting yourself in a position where you're, you're establishing generational wealth 
in, 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 a, in a formula, in a way that um, you thought about as, as a child. And so now, hopefully, you know, if, if you do end up passing down that money, as well as the knowledge um, to your sons for the future. And all of that um, leads me into the question of, you know, you originally, the first words that you mentioned when you came on the show was to help people. Now we talk about mobile home investing, but your energy, before even saying anything about you, you said it was to help people. Mm -hmm. um, and I respect that. And so my question for you is that it's the last question that I ask everyone that's ever been on Define Your Legacy. And that question is, how do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered, who that's a good one. Um, for one, I definitely want to be remembered as someone who is authentically them in every situation, good or bad. You know what I mean? It's like when you when you interacted with me, whether it was on this platform, in person, uh, via com telephone, whatever, like he was authentically himself because he was comfortable in his own skin. Um, and that's one of those things, even growing up, as I said, you know, with uh, the financial issues and everything like that, where sometimes I was even uncomfortable, you know, going to school, wearing the same pair of jeans, three, four, five days in a row wearing the same hoodie all winter long because that's the only one I had, things like that, right? So being very comfortable in his own skin. Um, secondly, for my kids, I want them to, to remember me as a dad who was always ever present and who was always there to listen, to hear them. Like my father wasn't really here. Actually, no, he literally wasn't here. You know what I mean? So, so I always tried to be like, okay, what would I have wanted? That's what I'm trying to be for my sons and always encouraging them um, and trying to lay like a blueprint and a foundation for them. Like, hey, if you want to work, that's cool, but there's other options. Even looking at, well, okay, like my son, you know, he says he wants to be a builder, right? Like he wants to build houses and stuff. I'm like, that's cool. Like, that's dope. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever thought about though, like the people who like own those companies and make those companies, like they are, you know, they, they can do a bunch of different buildings instead of just one building at a time. And, you know, trying to open and expand their mind to other things that I was never like privy to, was never exposed to. So just, you know, being authentically me and my son's just looking at my, looking at them. Like my dad was a guy who really tried to expose us to all of our opportunities and, and present a smorgasbord of things we could do no matter what anybody else had to say about us. Right. Like three little black kids, but it didn't matter. Like y'all could still do whatever you want to do. Um, but you got to just stand on it, whatever it is. Don't let nobody tell you no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I respect that. And also, you know, just understanding we're in a completely different era. Mm -hmm. you know, and our, our time truly is now. And I mm -hmm. think sometimes, too, when we mention whether or not someone was educated about financial literacy and, and if they weren't, right, that can actually play a factor into your overall development. Yeah. But at some point, as you get older, what you have to remember is, and then you kind of alluded this to before, is no one is going to save you, right? Mm -hmm. Like the government no. does not care if no one talks about financial literacy. You still have to file your taxes, right? Inflation does not care. <laughs> If you try to, to, to invest your money, it, it's going to, you know what I'm saying, damage the value of your purchasing power. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Life. You, you mentioned that the, your personal corporate job, like certain things aren't going to care about you. And that's just the sad mm -hmm. reality we live in. But it's our job as human beings to provide yeah. a better lifestyle for ourselves, um, as well as our family members. And, and to people out there um, that grew up in a Singapore household, you know, coming off the story that you just told is like, whatever it is that you've gone through in life, you want to do your best to make sure that your children don't have to go through that, right? So even exactly. from a financial literacy perspective, if you feel like no one ever taught me this, it is what it is, but make mm -hmm. sure that you don't allow the people coming up after you, especially your children. Like, yes, you don't want to, you know, tell, tell the world about certain things, whatever, but to your children, make sure that they don't go through the same things you did. That's, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, 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 just, that's just your negligence at that point. Yeah. Right. Like, you know what there's missing. That's one of the things I get tired of, you know, people blaming like, hey, the school should teach X, Y, Z. I'm like, well, you're at home with your kids all day long. Why don't you do it? You know, me and my wife have, have made a, a, like a like a, a determined effort to be like, hey, we're going to educate you on these things. We're not leaning on the school for anything. We're leaning on them to give you the basics of, you know, math and science and whatever. But even certain things, even within the school curriculum or outside of it, just financial stuff and economics and entrepreneurship, and things like that. We are definitely very involved in being like, no, like, here's some things you need. We need to talk about. We're very open. We're, we're talking about it. We're not hiding it. We're not sugarcoating it. We're like, this is what it is. Y'all are mature enough. And what we found is that, like, even at the age of five, six, seven, whatever, like, just because they're that young, they're not stupid and they're not naive. They understand. But you have to break it down to them in a way that makes sense. 
and relate it to them, right? Like they might like blocks and stuff. Okay, well, let's take these blocks over here and let's explain what this means. Boom, 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 boom. Right. And now they get it. And now they go out into the world and they're better for it. And I appreciate the two of you doing that because I think also as well as like people will, will, will mention like, oh, you know, they're too young to talk about these things. Let them enjoy their youth. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that's obviously important, right? People, yeah. children have to enjoy their youth, right? You're not sitting here saying that you're about to, you know, sit them down for three hours and talk to a five-year-old no, about no. a Roth IRA. But at the no. same time, we have to understand that at some point, whether you like it or not, you have to talk to them about it. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's always going to be an excuse for certain people as to why, you know, they don't talk about financial literacy to their children. Right. It, you know, when they're, you know, in, in elementary school, oh, they're too young. Or, you know, if they're in middle school, we wait and say, like, oh, the, you know, the school system is going to teach. Or, <laughs> well, when they get to high school, you say, well, they're about to be in college pretty soon. So the college yeah. is going to teach them like it, it has to happen at some point, whether we want to have the fresh, the, 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 the rough conversations, it has to happen. <laughs> but I think, unfortunately, as I, as I say this out loud, um, you can't teach what you don't know. Man, I was just thinking that. Um, I was just thinking that. Have and, these people, they're not opening up insurance policies for their kids, accounts yeah. for their kids. They're literally just waiting on the kid to do it themselves. It's like, nah, you do it for them and then explain to them later, like, I've already built this for you. Yeah. Here's why. Here's what it's for. Here's yes. what you can do with it. Yes, 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 yes. And it's like, please, y'all, like, life is so much bigger than us as individuals. If we really mm-hmm. want to continue to push this narrative of, of Black wealth, I think we have to understand that it's way more important than just as than just us as individuals. Um, mm-hmm. And even if you're a person listening out there who may feel like, all right, I don't know much about this stuff. That is all the reason in the world why you should want to continue to learn um, as much as you can about this. But um, I will say this, man, thank you for being on the show. Um, but if you could- Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely, man. This is a powerful, powerful um, conversation. I think it was a mix of everything, right? Your story, talking about um, everything that you've gone, gone through to this point mobile home investing overall, just kind of building for the future. Um, but if you could, man, drop your your social media, um, your YouTube, your coaching program, where people can find you if they need it for more information, um, everything, man. Run run, uh, run wild with the promo. Yeah, I mean, if anything, definitely Instagram, official B. Boyd on Instagram. Um, YouTube, official B. Boyd on there. Uh, Officialbboyd.com, right? I'm trying to be consistent here. So you can go to officialbboy.com and actually find the coaching program. There's three levels. And this goes back to me trying to have something for everybody, right? It's not just, hey, pay me 8,000 bucks, daddy, God. It's nothing like that, right? So definitely hit that up. Also, you can go to workwithcoachbrandon.com where you can actually get like a little mini free training video type thing I did. Um, And also book a free call with me, right? You can go in there, book a free call. We can jump on just like we're doing right here. We can talk about mobile home investing for a bit, see if it's something that actually fits you and I can talk to you about the program or whatever. So if anything, I would say, hey, man, Google official B-Boyd and all of my stuff's going to pop up. That's the easiest way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, are, are there uh, any final words that you have for our audience to define legacy? If anything, I say, um, I think I put it out there the other day, like uh, the biggest, the most selfish thing you could do is not be an active participant in building, you know, your, your family's legacy. And that's what I would tell everybody who's listening, whether, you know, whenever this comes out or whatever, like be an active participant, just like we talked about at the end of educating our children. Sometimes it doesn't have to be your children. It could be your nieces, your nephews, the neighborhood kids. Like it it just needs to be the next generation, quite honestly, like educating them um, and being an active participant, whether it's like, hey, you know what? I don't have any kids, but I'm going to link up with the the boys and girls club down the street and we're going to go all open up bank accounts for them. Right. And then we're going to work with the community to start depositing money in those accounts. So by the time they're in college or whatever the case may or high school or whatever the case may be, they have a surplus of money that they can go do whatever it is with, whether that's write a book, start a business, use it for school, whatever it is, because we continue to we continue to put our kids out there, our youth out there, and they're starting in a hole. They're always starting in a hole. Our our peers, you know, our counterparts. Um, I should say they're not starting in holes because their families were active participants and actually trying to build a nest egg or something that they could leverage to take them to other heights and other places. So just be an active participant and actually trying to build something for your children or, or your community around you that they then can take and, you know, uh, go to the next level with. I mean, because, right, I mean, frankly, the fruits of your labor should be for beyond your lifetime. That's what it should be for, not just for right now. It should be. 10 years from now, when you're dead and gone, and they can look back and be like, oh, man, these built that for these kids for this day. That's why they all can do this. You know what I mean? So just be active. Be active and, and, and you know, 
everything else will take care of, take care of itself. Yeah, yeah. And I told you before we started recording too, like you know, all the money in the world, and, and it's and it's nice. Again, don't get it twisted, y'all. This is definitely you know financial literacy podcast. We talk about business and just overall investing, everything like that. Um, but at the same time, nobody wants an empty funeral. Nobody, mm-hmm. nobody, 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 nobody. Um, so make sure you 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 take care of the things that are important. Also, just believe that you can do it too. You know, that's the yeah. whole point of having conversations like this. Um, it just all I gotta like, do is touch one. That's it. One, and you'd be surprised at the at, at the amount of people that may need your information. Like, don't get caught up in the amount of followers that you have, or you know, what I'm saying whatever. Like, someone like there are billions with a B, <laughs> billions <laughs> of people on this earth. I guarantee yeah. you, you have knowledge and information that at least one person needs. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, but yeah, yeah. So on the Defined Legacy front, make sure um, you follow Defined Legacy everywhere. All right. Defined Legacy on Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook. Um, Theus, subscribe to Theus Elijah on YouTube as well as TikTok. Um, and make sure, you know, you give the podcast Defined Legacy a five star rating. Um, and again, uh, make sure you check out the online store. OK, if you want to grab a T-shirt or a long sleeve or hoodie um, in the link in the description of this episode. But just like that. Um, again, appreciate you, Brandon, for, for being on the show. Um, definitely means a lot. And I know for a fact that people got something out of it. So just like that, y'all, we gone. Peace.